So hi everybody. Today's lab is about moments of inertia. So real quick, let's recap what we learned about moments of inertia in lecture so we can understand what it means. So the best way to understand moment of inertia is to make sort of an analogy to something a little bit simpler that you're a little bit more familiar with, which is mass. So the first time we encountered mass uh, was back in physics 44 in the equation F equals ma, Newton's second law. So if we kind of think about what the role that that m term plays, the mass term, in Newton's second law, we can understand conceptually what it is. So you can think of mass this way. The more mass something has, the more force that it's going to take to get it to accelerate at a given rate. Okay, if an object has less mass, then it takes less force to get it to accelerate at a given rate. That's the role it plays in F equals ma. So, in a sense, you can think of mass as being a resistance that an object has to being accelerated. So, if we apply that idea, but just to a rotating object, we have moments of inertia. So, there is a rotational version of Newton's second law, as we learned, which goes like tau is equal to i times alpha. And what that says is the net torque that is exerted on an object is equal to its moment of inertia, that's i, times alpha, that's the angular acceleration. So, what role does the moment of inertia, or I, play in this equation? It's a resistance to being rotated. So the, the more moment of inertia an object has, the more resistant it is to being rotated. And what we're going to do today is measure the moment of inertia experimentally of an object. Okay, so this is our experimental setup. Let me uh, show you what we have here. We have a giant metal disc, which is our rotor, and wrapped around um, this shaft right here, that inner shaft of the rotor, we have a string. Now, connected to the end of the string is a little hook, which we can hang some weight from. The basic big picture idea behind the experiment here is this. We're trying to measure the moment of inertia of this rotating uh, disc, right? So. If we apply Newton's second law for rotation, torque is equal to I times alpha, if we know the torque that we're applying to this thing, and we know the angular acceleration that results from that, we can automatically calculate the moment of inertia. That's more or less how this is going to go. So part of that is understanding all the different torques that are acting on the rotor. Well, obviously if we hang some weight from uh, the end of this string right here. That's going to create some tension. And that tension is going to exert a torque on the rotor that's going to make it start spinning this way. However, that's not the only torque that's present. There's another torque, which is actually due to friction. Okay, so there's actually some friction uh, in the rotor. We need to know how much friction there is in order to do our calculation properly. So the very, very first step of this is to figure out the torque due to friction in this rotor. So the way we're going to do this is as follows. I'm going to put some amount of weight on the end of this rotor, and I'm, I'm going to put a very small amount to start, okay? And I'm going to show you what happens when I take a very small amount of weight, and I just push the rotor a little bit so it starts moving, it almost immediately comes to a stop. Okay, so what that's telling me is the torque due to the tension in the string was smaller than the torque due to friction. So friction just brought this thing to a stop. Now let me show you what happens if I hang a lot of weight from the end of the string. Okay, so I'm gonna put a couple hundred gram masses on the end here. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna give it a little push so it starts moving, and now notice how it doesn't come to a stop. In fact, it just speeds up as time goes on, okay? So what, I, what I've just showed you is there's some amount of weight we can hang here where if I give the rotor a little push, it just comes to a stop, and if I put a lot more weight than that, I can give the rotor a little push, and it just keeps spinning faster and faster as time goes on. You can imagine there's some kind of sweet spot in the middle there where if I give the rotor a push, 
it's not going to come to a stop and it's not going to just speed up as it uh, continues spinning, but instead it's just going to move at a constant speed. So that's what we're trying to achieve here, constant velocity motion. Now why is this important? Well, if the rotor is spinning at a constant velocity, that means the torque due to the tension in the string here is exactly counteracted by the torque due to friction. And since we know how much tension is in the string, it's pretty easy to calculate. I'll show you how to do that in the handout. I automatically know how much torque there is due to friction. Okay, so when this thing moves at constant speed, there's an exact balance of torques between friction and the tension. And knowing that, I can calculate the torque due to friction, which again is something we need to do overall for this experiment to work. All right. So with a little bit of trial and error, what I was able to do was determine um, the mass that you need to hang from the end of the string here in order for the wheel to rotate at a constant speed and also for the hanging mass to fall down at a constant speed. Um, I had to just sort of tinker with the mass a little bit. Uh, we have slotted masses that I was able to hang from the end, which go down to the nearest five grams. I also have paper clips, which each one is a gram, so I can determine what this mass is to the nearest gram just by tinkering with uh, different weights that I hang off the end. Okay, so after doing that, I was able to determine that the hanging mass is 280 grams on the dot, actually. So this is what it looks like when I give the wheel a little push. You'll notice that it's spinning at a more or less constant speed. And if you watch the hanging mass fall down, it's falling down at also a constant speed, which is exactly what we want. So 280 grams is the mass we need for everything to move at a constant speed. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do next. We wanna look at what happens when the rotor accelerates rather than simply moving at a constant velocity. So we were able to achieve constant velocity motion by hanging 280 grams off the end. What we're gonna do is simply add to that, it stands to reason that if we add some uh, mass to what we had before, it's going to speed up as it rotates rather than just rotating at a constant rate. That's the idea. So we're gonna add 200 grams for a total of 480 grams off the end of the hook. And what we're going to do is start the rotor from a state of rest. So the idea is I'll just hold it in place like this and then I'll let it go. It'll begin to start rotating and the hanging mass will begin to start falling towards the ground. What we want to do is just time that fall to the ground. Okay, starting from a known height above the ground. So I'm going to use this meter stick here to measure the height. We want to start at a height of 75 centimeters. So that means the bottom of the weight holder is at a height of 75 centimeters off the ground. So there it is. I'm gonna actually time this using my phone. So the idea will be, uh, I'll hit start on my phone stopwatch as soon as I let go of the rotor, and then I'll hit stop as soon as I hear the weights hit the ground. That's the idea. So let's try it. Okay, so now it's going. And now the weights have hit the ground. What I got for this trial was 8.65 seconds. I'm not going to show you all five trials, but I'm going to repeat this uh, for a total of five trials. I'll flash the time for the other four trials up on the screen right now. So that does it for the experiment. Um, you've seen how it goes, all the different steps you need to take, and all the different relevant pieces of data we've collected. So using the data we collected today in the video, you should be able to calculate the moment of inertia of the rotor. Now, this calculation isn't all that straightforward. There are a lot of different steps you need to take before you arrive at your final answer of the moment of inertia. So the handout that I gave you that goes along with this video is going to show you step by step how to make those calculations. Okay, so follow the handout. You should be able to determine the moment of inertia of the rotor. So that's it for today. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, be safe, be healthy out there. 
See you later.